and from your community. My name is Lieutenant Bob Shakur. Um, well, the primary factor for me was watching people coming back in and out of prison as I was sitting there to be sentenced to pretrial. And I found out that I needed to restructure my thinking first. But I also had to adhere to my um, sentencing order by the judge. I had to do the Key of the Crest program. And I watched that people that were doing the Key of the Crest program was constantly coming back. So how do I balance um, restructuring my thinking, but not allowing them to get me in this cycle of coming back to prison. So besides doing the program, I came up with a, um, a theory that I need to get in the corner, get by myself, and get honest about why I came to prison and the root causes of why I was coming back and forth to prison, and that was my substance abuse issue. So I knew that they was allowing drug dealers you know, that was getting sentenced for drug charges to come inside these um, drug programs for addicts in prisons. So I had to be honest, not only to myself, but be honest to the people that was around me that I'm not here for selling drugs. I'm here because I was a drug user. And drug using wasn't my only issue. There was core issues that I was dealing with, such as anger, resentment um, towards my family. Um, and towards myself for making the decisions I made. Um, so, in doing that, inside the drug program, I got me a corner by the side, I opened up a book, and I did that every morning. I read that book every morning to myself before I started, you know, adhering to the um, policies and, and the program rules. Um, my thing was not learning, not getting out of prison. It was learning how to never return and getting with the people that can teach me how to never return to prison and be productive in society. So that was my goal from pre-trial on, was to learn how to never return to prison ever again. And as a result of making that decision, I sit before you today. And Shakur, when you talk about those folks who helped you, who were those folks who helped you? First and foremost, I had to lean back um, on my last um, sentence in um, SCI to what I was taught through the Green Tree program with Khalil and brothers like Ed Fountain Grand. Um, so I, I, I fell back on, on, on their uh, way of thinking and um, doing that, it allowed me to navigate not only through my prison sentence, through my, um, through my work release sentence, but also through getting off probation. And all I had to do was just listen to what was being told to me and find my way within that system and to never return. And that was it. Thank you. So we have 10 more minutes till we get to Q&A, so I'm gonna move it along a little bit. We talked about barriers. I know folks asked about barriers. Let's talk about what were some of the barriers to being able to receive the treatment and the help that you needed while you were incarcerated at KSAP. This is to you. Yes, my name is Asa Johnson. Uh, I served 20 years at uh, James T. Vaughan Correctional Center. The remainder of my sentence was the key program. Um, I was released in July 7th, 2017. Um, there were a lot of barriers. Uh, one that comes to mind is the counselors and the classification. Um, during this time of this sentence that I was serving, uh, I was classified at a point in November and my counselor asked me why wasn't I at the key program and I was like I don't know I'm just doing time working down in the wood shop and coming back getting status sheet so the point of it is is that it was missed and I was supposed to be going to the key program so it was a mandatory classification that had to be done uh, the record of the times was getting lost and getting um, the people in the proper place, you know, to do the classification and know these things, I could have been ran over all my time. Um, education was not a problem, but that wasn't a barrier because that's one thing they promote. But trades and things that are relevant to skills that help an individual as they move into the prison and transition out. A lot of barriers. 
Thank you for that. So we're moved to barriers and we're gonna on to barriers specifically for reentry. Before that, so the things that are needed that reentry has to start are those social service needs that we talked about and we've heard. It's employment, housing, transportation, food, education, health care, and child care. And as far as treatment, we've also heard previously about cognitive behavioral health treatment, which is needed, including substance use and that mental health treatment and additional supports. Things as addressing trauma, substance use, relationship building, victim impact, life skills, support groups. And one of the things that we have yet to see is family reunification. Family reunification is something that needs to start while those are incarcerated. My husband and I have been able to be successful because of who we are as individuals, the work that we've been able to do. But that's not being taught, it's not being offered. The men that I serve don't have those skills and they don't know how to even ask for it and neither do their families. So that family reunification piece is a barrier that needs to be addressed. So last two questions, we'll go back to Khalil. What were some additional barriers upon re-entry? And then we'll hear from somebody else who can talk about some successes because solutions need to come and that's what we're here for today. So my barriers started when I was incarcerated um, and they just kind of continued when I was getting released. Um, when I became incarcerated at age 17 with a natural life sentence plus five years, the attitude of the Department of Correction was I'll never see the streets again so they wouldn't offer you treatment, right? It was based on your sentence, your crime, things of that nature. Um, the treatment administrator at the time told me that the only thing that DOC cared about is as long as I didn't hurt anybody else and I didn't hurt myself. That was it. No programs would be offered to me because I, I was never getting out. Um, for me, that was difficult to hear because I knew something was wrong. Um, like, I, I just knew it intuitively. I knew something was wrong. Um, and I begged him for 18 months to allow me to participate in the program so I can figure out how I ended up where I was at because I didn't want to hurt anybody else. Um, <coughs> finally, they relented. They told me they would just give me one opportunity. Um, it's kind of been my, man, my mantra um, all these years is I only get one opportunity. Um, I recognize that for me, things was a little different just because of my sentence. Um, another, the thing that made the barriers um, more difficult to overcome is there was a one-size-fits-all approach to how things were done when I went to prison in 1992. So um, whatever applied to him doing three years, him doing 20 years, me doing a life sentence, that's just the way it was, right? The only thing I got out of classification was they allowed me to spill, spend more money in commissary. Honestly, that, that's really what it was at the time. That's the way it was structured. So coming home when, in 2012, when the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional to give the juvenile life sentence, I was given an opportunity. Um, you know, fortunately for me, because of my persistence while I was incarcerated, I was able to prepare myself for a reentry. This isn't something that is common and 99% of individuals incarcerated that are doing a, a significant amount of time do not have the opportunities that I fought for for myself. Um, so when you get these opportunities, and again, when the Supreme Court changed the law, it was sudden. So you had individuals that were down 30, 40 years that had been locked up since they were juveniles that were suddenly gravely be released and because of their sentence and their crime, they never was afforded an opportunity for treatment and they were just dumped on the street, right? Uh, and I still communicate with some of those individuals today. Coming home, the biggest barrier was the same thing. It was a one size fits all approach. They never tried to assess what my needs were, right? Um, and they put me in MCI in Dover. I'm not from Dover, I'm from Wilmington. I've been incarcerated 25 years. I went to prison when I was 17. I know nothing about Dover, nothing whatsoever. The same approach they had for him is the approach they had for me. When it came to job seeking, they gave me a map they printed off of Google. I didn't even know what Google was. They printed a map off of Google, gave it to me, and told me to go out job seeking. My first day, I walked to the corner, turned around, and went back in the facility. 
They said, why are you here? I said, because I don't know where I'm at. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what to do. You know, I need some help. They wasn't there to help me. They told me, you gotta figure it out on your own. I had to actually break the rules to do the right thing. We're not allowed to get a ride if you go out job seeking. You're not allowed to have anybody pick you up, right? If you get a job, you're not allowed to have anybody pick you up. So what I had to do is I had to get my wife to pick me up, right? I had to pick, have her pick me up two blocks away just to take me job seeking so I can get a job. Um, I had to walk back and forth to work. It wasn't safe. So I had to have her pick me up and drop me off two blocks from the facility just so I could get back in a safe fashion to make the transition. And they didn't really understand or care how difficult it was, right? Um, so when, like, Dawu talks about the post-incarcerated syndrome and things of that nature, um, like, those things I experienced in real time. And because of the one-size-fits-all approach, they really didn't do anything. And if it wasn't for me having family support, I, I would probably end up back. Can I ask the first question? Yes. I mean, that's a good segue to the Q&A. Uh, I just, and I'd like for you to talk about, um, let me see, Asa, you did 20. Talk about institutionalization, if you could. Give, give people here an idea what it's like to be institutionalized, um, that they can relate. I'm, I'm gonna be very, very brief, but just to give you a picture, um, I first went into the Department of Corrections at the age of 18, and it was like a playground. Um, most of my neighborhood friends are from South Bridge and Wilmington. Most of my friends were already there. I was scared to come out because I was a young boy, but uh, they made me come out and it was just like a little city. But as time evolved, things start to change, policies start to come where that it's not the same as it is today. But they, it had me feeling like I was comfortable because of the things that we were allowed to do. And as time went on, when they started taking that away, we still continued with the lifestyle that we were doing on the street that put us in incarceration in the first place. So it made me feel like I was part of a family inside that incarceration. And as uh, I became as I became older, I realized that things were getting tougher and I wasn't getting any younger. But it, it, it's just a criminal lifestyle of a whole bunch of criminals who think alike because we're in that cycle. We come from a cycle from the muck, which is the hood or the projects, the poverty, and we all went through the same thing. So that would make that what made me feel like it was a family because from the people from Riverside, the people from the Bucket, the people from South Bridge, Hilltop, everything, even though we fought, we still, we're still in the muck. So we related. And uh, incarceration, you know, it, it was needed for me, for me to be where I'm at today because I had to experience that. I had to go through that. And I see today that a lot of these young brothers and sisters out here, they definitely need our guidance because we've already been there. Thank you. I Thank hope this cycle. Thank you. EJ, you good? Good afternoon again. So I'm Bishop Coy Stewart from New Life Ministries Unlimited and Life Recovery Solutions. We do transitional housing, among other things. So my question first is, what does the literature or data say about the barriers to reentry? And is there a correlation between those barriers to reentry to preempt people from going in the first place? So the literature and the data shows that there are four, the four main categories, gotta get back to my notes, the four main categories that need to be addressed. And those are, if that's not in place and if those factors aren't being addressed, that the chances of recidivism are going to be high. And those are social and community environments. And under that will fall. A certain age will know that. Um, poverty, poor access to health care, 
lower levels of education and violent high crime neighborhoods. So if you're living in those areas, and let's talk about access to healthcare. Opportunity doesn't mean access. And I think that's also something that we have to recognize in our state of Delaware, especially if you are living in the South. Um, addressing circumstances before incarceration. Were they victims of trauma? Were they victims of other things? What are the mental health challenges? What is the substance use? And low familial support. Let's face it, most folks coming into incarceration don't have the familial um, role models or support because if they did, that would be a resilient factor. We talk about the ACEs um, and higher levels. We do this for the Department of Education. Those who are coming into incarceration have higher ACE levels than those who, who aren't incarcerated. You have to look at the events that happened during incarceration. So was there misconduct? Was there maladjustment? Did they have access to programs and did they have access to mental health treatment? Most of the men that we work with in the, in the prisons, it takes them a long time to get that access to the treatment and it's not always the appropriate treatment. And so that's why the fourth step is access to appropriate treatment. We can't put a one size fits all. We have to address the root problem and the root causes. If we in society never address the root causes, we are always going to be trying to fix something in a way that doesn't need to be fixed. And our communities are suffering. And then real quick, difficult adjusting to back to life after incarceration, employment, housing, transportation, education, healthcare, family reunification, and social support. So with, that, so with that data and that information, is there some type of continuum of care or integration for uh, providers in those various areas to make the process work? So we would have to do a study to see what exists. I can tell you that from the folks that we know or that these gentlemen know and work with, the answer is no, or there is at least not enough of it. So one of the things that we've started, if you, what missed ops is, it's really taking all of these factors, the family unification piece, the cognitive behavioral health piece, all of that, and saying we're building a model that is going to support this. Y'all, if you have any psychology background, this is all about Maslow hierarchy of need. We have to start with the bottom. We have to start with addressing housing, food insecurities, transportation, jobs, and health care. If you cannot provide that successfully or somebody can't access it successfully, the chances of them committing crimes or not getting the help and support that they need isn't going to happen. They can't be able to then work on themselves. They can't be able to address their mental health needs, their substance use needs. They can't be that parent for their kids who are at home. And that's why this is so critical. There are over 3,000 individuals who are incarcerated in Delaware right now. There are almost 3,000 folks who come home. There's over 10,000 people who are on probation and parole right now in this state. And we need to do better. They deserve better. They deserve to have the chance like these three gentlemen up here do. Like all of those who are in this audience, if you have been incarcerated and you have re-entered, and you are doing well, please stand up and let's give them a round of applause because they have had to fight systems that have been built to keep them down. And you all have to excuse me. This is Sandra. my passion. Sandra, I appreciate that. Go ahead. And we have one right here. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Timeless Thomas, and I'm not going to talk about my great book. I'm not going to talk about the book. People nonchalantly have thanked the lieutenant governor and her staff for the work that they're doing, but I'm a lived experience, and based on the vicarious healing power in the listening tours, me being an ex-offender, functioning in trauma, being easily distracted, had a place to vent and share my thoughts and ideas, which ultimately pushed me back into a leadership position in my household, in my community. This is all based on being 
HC. So it's not a regular thing when we're all in this room together, different organizations, the, the networking potential. We don't take this for granted when the lieutenant governor puts something like this together and then wait for her to do more. We're here. The time is now. Amen. The lived experience is here. Yeah. There's the swimming pool. Here's the day. Here's the day. Let's go. Yes. And so I would like to leave one last thing. This can't have been today. It's people who were in the streets. It's people who live in our neighborhoods. Everybody in here can write down right now what is one thing that you can commit to to keep this going and really be the change. Here we go. Hello. So the answer to your question, you said, I want to help. I want to help. Um, I have never been in jail, but I, you can say I've been in jail because I'm a walking proof. My dad, um, his name was Hubcat. Y'all know him. When he got, he came home, he used to tell me in the corner to tighten up the keeper. Like, I'm like, oh, I gotta put my hands on my knees, Dad. Oh, I gotta put my hands on my knees. Tighten up, tighten up. It told me every step. So when we say, when you come out, it was no family united. I didn't get that. My dad was in jail up until my ninth grade year in high school. And he died. But when he came home, he, it was just reading, going back, going back, going back, because that's what he was used to. So we need that in our community on how we can reunite the families. My dad didn't have anything. All he knew was selling drugs, selling drugs. When I was little, I used to go to um, Gander Hill. I used to go to all the prisons, because visitation, they took pictures. You had to stand by the wall and say cheese, and they give you a Kodak picture right there. You go to the vending machine. But I was happy. I used to walk around and say, Dad, I'm going to be a warden. I'm going to be a warden because I'm going to let you free. So then when as I got older, and this is how I got introduced to the criminal justice system, as I got older, I wanted to become a cop. My first job was Roanoke, Virginia, police department. Cause I was like, Dad, when you get out, I'ma set you free. This is my mentality of why I wanna be in law enforcement. Cause I want my dad home with me. So I'm, I'm six years old, wanna be a cop, and I achieved that goal to be a cop, but it wasn't what I wanted to be. It wasn't no rehabilitation or reentry. And then I said, I don't wanna be a cop. Teresa Crothers. If you guys know her, I was her, shout out to her, I was her intern in adult probation. I was her little intern, I was a probation officer. She said, beat me up, did that, liked it. She said, I don't wanna do that anymore. She said, I said, what's the next goal? Cause I wanna get to the root of the problem. She said, go work in the prison system. I worked there. I did not like what I seen. I support the criminal justice system to the fullest, but if it's done the correct way, People should have jobs when they come home. Don't just let them out in the street. They should come, they should, okay, you got to run. But I just want to say, I want to make a change. And if there's any way I can do or be a part of that, whether it's financially, whether it's coming to talk to people, I want to be a part of that change. So I will give you my number when we leave, and I want to be a part of that change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are on time. And if one of you just wants to briefly wrap up, I would really appreciate it. Briefly, if any of you is a pastor, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody take us out real quick with a thing. So, um, I like to say this. Change is on the horizon. Change has been coming for quite some time, right? So, like, we teach the impact of crime on victims in the prison. We teach it in SCI, we teach it in Jane Hall. And over the past month, and this is why I say change is, is, is on the horizon and it's coming, is over the past month, um, they started a new program called Tamar, right? And it's a trauma program. And it's gonna be a game changer within the Department of Corrections. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because I've, I've been asked to help tutor and mentor the peers there and work with the Tamar program. And it starts with making sure that every single person within the Department of Corrections is trauma informed because most of us, we communicate from our trauma. So if you can understand that, then you can understand how you can be of benefit as we continue to move forward. Thank you for this opportunity today.